Well, um, my name is Jerry Diamond and I uh, live here in Cheater County. And basically for quite a few years I've been just focusing more and more on research, trying to figure out how to help people um, and in, in as many different areas as possible. And I'm talking food production, food um, preservation, um, how to increase the, the, the content of your food, uh, fermenting as opposed to canning. Um, and just everything else, shelter. We're in a geodesic dome here that, you know, is, um, uh, I'm testing and tweaking and helping them perfect, um, improve the quality of it. Um, just, you know, shelter's critical. I've always thought of two, two things, shelter in the way of housing, shelter and then housing. House is what you live in, you know, it's typically a stick house, but it can be a geodesic dome. But, you know, instant shelter. 100 people show up, what are we gonna do? 5,000 people show up. How do, how, do you, how do you shelter them instantly and then make the transition into normal housing? Yeah, I mentioned uh, coronal mass ejections, and there's, uh, you know, there was a, once uh, 18, in the 1800s, a, you know, Carrington effect it wiped out. Not any, there was net, net, nowhere near the infrastructure that we have now, but it still it was a uh, you know major uh, power outage and problems. And uh, today, if that happened, it would be far worse. And in addition, I mean, you have the uh, uh, a lot of what they call um, you know uh, remote viewing. Uh, major Ed Dames talks about what they call the kill shot sequence. So they 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 do see a huge. Uh, a whole series of coronal mass ejections, and they see they see that that's going to you know cause um, a huge amount of uh, change and loss of life on the planet. Um, so we, you know, as best we can. I mean, you know, again, if you're living in a rural situation, we're going to you're going to be in better shape than living in a huge city that where when the power goes on, everything goes down, sanitation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So. Um, question about you know how EMP, EMP could come into play. Absolutely, I mean that could happen um, at any time. Whether whether and not just a war situation, but a terrorist situation. The uh, there's a really excellent book <coughs> called um, Lights Out by David Crawford. Uh, it was a hit. It was an online sensation. He posted it as he wrote it, and the scenario in that book is. And if I don't know what year it was, but Mechanics Illustrated. Uh, cover story had a, a color, beautiful color schematic of how to build an EMP bomb, you know, missile. And the whole article, you know, telling you in detail how to build one. Uh, well, in this scenario in Lights Out, uh, some terrorist uh, actually gets a hold of and builds a, uh, an EMP bomb and sets it off over America. And, of course, that takes out, you know, the entire grid. And so it's it's a scenario that could happen, or or even um, it could be an astronomical, uh, you know, some kind of a pulse or something from space. A, a massive CME, coronal mass ejection, could destroy a lot of the electronics in this country, computer systems, um, and backup systems as well. So those are going to take out communications. They're going to destroy switching systems. They're going to destroy communication systems. They're going to destroy water treatment plants. Everything, our entire lives, are based around transistorized modern components, which can be destroyed in the space of one second. Very susceptible to that. Then again, we go back to a very brutal, a very... Um, down to earth, a very um, medieval type of a situation, almost instantaneously, literally overnight, it would be. Um, so. That's good. Why people can't see this plain view concept? Well, I would say primarily it's, again, um, a conditioning. Uh, brainwashing, you know, the, the society we live in, we, we have, think we have to have a certain type of house, we have to have a certain way of living, um, and I just think we need to break free of that, get out of that. Um, we have, uh, oh man, 
lost it. Sorry. I had I had a good uh, a good take on it. I'm tired. <laughs> Skip that one. <coughs> I'm not doing good on that question. <laughs> Examples of food, water, housing in plain view. Um, the food, uh, you know, is, is in a lot of areas of the country, there is food everywhere. And this is one thing that a lot of people, uh, my grandchildren, are learning is going out in the woods and, and finding edible food, lamb's quarters, and, and uh, you know, plantain is edible, uh, comfrey. And not only are a lot of these herbs edible, but they're very healing, very powerfully healing. I made the statement one time, I was at a meeting, it was uh, actually the Well-Fed Neighbor Alliance uh, first annual picnic, and I made this statement to one guy about, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of people going to be coming here into this region. And boy, the fire was in his eyes. He said, do you have any idea how fast starvation sets in? And I made the exact same statement just a few minutes later to a different man, and he said, well, of course, that we have food everywhere here. Every broadleaf plant is food. We just need to eat it, and you can chew it, juice it, whatever. I mean, we have food everywhere, so that's an example of food. Um, Shelter-wise, uh, you know, we need you need shelter. We don't need to live in a McMansion. We can build a shelter out of many things. Um, uh, I looked at a soccer ball, and I, I saw that all the lines on it are straight lines. So I designed a geodesic dome that was, doesn't have hubs uh, in the traditional sense of a geodesic dome. Food, uh, water. Well, water is, at least in some regions, there's pl it's plentiful. Uh, I'm from Colorado. You could walk for three days without water. Here in Missouri, you walk for three minutes. You're going to find a stream. You're going to find a pond, you know. Um, that's just, you know, we need to know how to, I guess in plain view, it would be, you know, learning how to filter it. You know, build a fire, build some, you know, get, burn some, char some oak down, make charcoal, get your handkerchief, and make a water filter. Make a tripod of sticks and pour water in it. You got clean water. So there's a, there's always a way to do things that is an alternate way to the traditional way of doing things. I need to pay three hundred dollars for a really fancy filter. Well, you can make one too. <laughs> so the question here is kind of relating to the difference between uh, water sources in cities and water sources uh, in, a, in a rural environment, let's say in a homesteading environment type of situation, in a, on a, in a farm environment, in a rural environment. Um, and this, this is a, it's something that is very hard for people to wrap their head around. But I'm gonna put it this way, you know, people think that water comes out of a tap. Well, the concept of, uh, there's a, a phrase, uh, meat on the hoof and crops in the ground. And from a, you know, when you look at, okay, let me just back up. Too, too many preppers, survivalists, have the idea that they're going to store some food. There's a book that we got early on, what to do with a bucket of wheat and no electricity. You know, and that's a starter place. But you get beyond that to, well, what are you going to eat next year? What are you going to eat the year after that? Um, I wrote a poem back when uh, I last Babylon and in it I talked about, you know, the, the war we fought for freedom 200 years ago dragged on for eight long dark years. Hunger pangs did many know. What are we going to do if you, the uh, classic, you know, when the posterior experiment hits the rotating oscillator, what if that's a seven year time? What if it's, uh, you know, a, a protracted period of time? You need to be growing your own food. Um, meat on the hoof and crops in the ground, that's what it refers to, is you know, the best method, the best method of food preservation, food storage, is not in a number 10 can. It walks around on its own four feet. It's in the ground every year. Uh, Jerusalem artichokes are fantastic. A friend of mine just had a party yesterday, 85th birthday party, and he had everybody could come over and harvest Jerusalem artichokes. They've been in the ground all winter long. Um, he is just a, a phenomenal at uh, growing Jerusalem artichokes. They're a food that you, they store themselves. They're in the ground, literally. Your food storage is in the ground. And that's a, living food is the best method of food preservation. Fresh, organic food. And this is so foreign to most people's concept of food storage. You know, I have my one year's food supply.
that's nice. Usually people, if they get into a pinch and they eat it, it's gone in three to six months. That one year of food supply is not a one year of food supply. Not good nutrition, and nor is it you know, really a long-term situation. We need to have a long-term, long-range planning here. So when we talk about uh, <clears throat> food storage um, as, a, as a part of the survivalist or prepper mentality, well, food storage is, is a good place to start. You need to go from that, though, to producing food. And more and more people are coming to understand this. That's why more and more people are seeking to homestead, to have their own chickens, to have their own goats, um, have a milk cow if possible, have a garden. And uh, so food storage is a beginning point, but there's only so much you can do in that realm. You can store up maybe a year's supply, if that. Um, and that's good for, I, I see that only as good for a transition period. Um, y we may have so many people flooding into certain areas that that food storage may, may come in handy. <laughs> and then, then you have to look at growing food, and that's where we need to be. We need to be more of on a long-term basis. Um, we also need to be in a region that is uh, amenable or um, ideal for doing that, of having a massive amount of food production and being able to have it be secure and have water. So that's my message. I mean, Beyond Off Grid is, is an awesome new concept I think it's going to be for a lot of people. Um, I, I'm almost in a sense I'm talking out beyond that, you know, <laughs> what area of the country are you in? Um, are, is that area of the country, is that state going to be um, a place where if things really go south, if it's gonna, is it going to be a place where you can actually stay? You got your homestead, but you know, are you going to be able to even stay there and, and hold that homestead? Um, so we'll get into that maybe more. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> question because of I don't want to. You know, that's really the biggest part of my, right. my message. We'll, you know, we'll get so, yeah, I, I figured. But that um, I got. That's you. a real good point because if you can't grow your food or can't secure your food, then the uh, the question about you know what what part of the country I, I talk about that a lot that's kind of my the focus of my message in a lot of ways the uh, there's a lot of areas of the country that, uh, one time I was talking with a man and uh, I said the Ozarks are the greatest place on the planet for survival agriculture and you know, I'm from Minnesota our soil's eight foot deep I said survival agriculture you know you live in tank country. Um, Flatlands are, you know, Hitler ran over Poland in what was it, three days, you know. Um, so we're talking about being able to grow. Ha number one, have water, have water. Uh, number two, grow your own food. Number three, have it be secure um, in a region that is, you know, has the, the people there, uh, the demographics, the uh, people of, of like mindset. Um, and to be able to uh, have the wood you need for building houses, for heating, um, to have the natural resources there, um, to have uh, everything you need. Um, in a nutshell, I mean, Jesus said, you know, um, you know, with food and raiment, therewith be content. And I've always thought of, you know, I mean, raiment to me is, is shelter. Okay, and a good example of that is, uh, I read extensively about the Inuit Indians. Um, up in the up in uh, northern Canada and whatnot, and um, they lived in their house. Meaning, the clothing they wore, they were capable of existing in an extremely bad climate. They 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 wore a house. Basically, they had a, a double caribou skin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one turned in, one turned out, and and it was it was housing. It was portable housing. They wore that. Okay, that's shelter. And so you go from that concept to the uh, idea of, well, what do we really need to have to have shelter? Well, we need to be free or protected from the elements. And that's, that's really what shelter is. And with that, with food and shelter, we should be, you know, we should be content. And if we are, if we're content with those things, we're free. 
more and more people are discovering uh, they're downsizing. I mean, they're living in tiny houses. There's a whole massive movement, um, 100, 200, maybe even, uh, and smaller, but you know, one to 300 square foot houses. And they're free, they're happy. They're enjoying life more than they've ever enjoyed it before because they're not a slave to a big mansion that they have to pay bills and they have to do this. They're living in a house that's paid for. They are free. Uh, far freer than people that have a um, you know multi-million dollar portfolios that think they're you know have something they don't. Good, good. Uh, did I bump it or something? Or? Hey, that was good. Um, We talked about the Ozark Plateau, we talked about why it's important. Can you talk about rural life in context of the Great Depression or any type of great calamities um, in terms of how I read some places where the Great Depression hit, but in the rural areas, they didn't even know there was a Great Depression because they weren't they weren't affected by it. They were right. so isolated. They, were, they had their own community, had their own kind of framework of things to where you know, they don't care what happens out there. So right. can you talk to, to her about that? Yeah. Um, a good example of, of how to face hard times was during the Depression. And when we moved here, um, I started talking to people and found that uh, one man said, well, people here were no worse off during the Depression than they were before it. Some people didn't know that there was a depression until after they found out, you know, oh, really? Um, one man said that, you know, the reason was because people were so poor here that, you know, it didn't make any difference. But I've heard other people say that they were better off. A lot of people were better off during the depression than they were before the depression because their food was worth more. There's a lady that lived not too far from here. I heard a kitty. Um, well, when I, when I first became a, a believer, um, I, I was uh, born and raised Catholic, and about senior year, um, I became a Christian. And one of the very early books that I read, and one of the authors I got into, I started reading about prayer and started reading about revival and the history of revival. And one man who was a, a British uh, preacher was a revival author, uh, Leonard Ravenhill, and th this kind of says it all in one sentence. Um, four words, Sodom had no Bible. Okay, uh, point being, and other people, can, you can stretch that out to, well, gee, if God doesn't judge America pretty soon, he's gonna have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. So yeah, we're, we're ripe for judgment. We, we know we've been uh, uh, murdering you know, unborn infants uh, for you know, decades now. Um, just legalizing things that should never have been, you know, even even condoned and it never have been condoned in normal society, you know, homosexuality and whatnot. Um, so, okay. Uh, you know, some people say, you know, if God uh, doesn't judge America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know, we have a uh, you know abortion industry going on, um, just massive amounts of, um, you know, the, the killing of, of, of innocent babies. And just the moral condition of this country is so um, degenerated that w one way to compare it is a lot of, some people have said, well, gee, my grandparents, you know, lived through the depression and everybody pulled together and it wasn't that bad. Um, they made it through, and the, where we're at now with the uh, just the um, entitlement mentality, and the, the you know the um, you owe me, and the church owes me, and God owes me, and the government owes me. Um, in a, in a breakdown situation, that is going to go south so fast, so rapidly, because you're not you don't have 
that core morality of, well, gee, there is right and wrong. Um, it's, it's not right to murder, it's not right to steal. Th those things are, are so far, there, there's, look at the industries that thrive on murder and, and um, uh, taking advantage of you know, the, the, the sex slave industry and, and you know, drug industry and all those. Those, are, those. those thrive on being evil, on being brave enough to kill an innocent person and to uh, just, just horrific things. Uh, biker gangs, you know, outlaw gangs. I mean, just just the uh, amount of um, degeneration and evil uh, glorified in those uh, different uh, types of organizations is, is just absolutely horrific. So, in a breakdown situation, we're going to be starting from a completely different uh, national mindset, morally and religiously, uh, spiritually, you know, economically, everything than anything we've ever even imagined before. It's, it's collapse. Well, you know, I've been believing that we were going to see a collapse for a lot of years and it, it is constantly amazing to a lot of people that, you know, maybe are like-minded to me, um, how things can hold together so long as they have. Um, I remember early on, about 93, getting to know a family, and I was going, you know, talking about this and that, and, you know, what about, and I goes, man, you know, I've been hearing this stuff for 20 years, you know. <laughs> and it got to the point where we were the same way. Um, We've, we've heard about these things for so long that it gets boring. And I've been telling my family this is going to happen. Someday this is going to happen. So the question when, you know, nobody can really say. We don't know. Is it imminent? Absolutely. You know, next week, I don't know. You know, next month, I don't know. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was believing that it was imminent enough that, like I said, we, you know, I, I've relocated my family ahead of time, you know, why try to, you know, evade all those, uh, you know, get, get comfortable in the city and, 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 you know, like slopping around with all, as I put, all the rest of the turkey farm inmates. Um, and then, you know, believe that someday, you know, when things suddenly go south, you're going to be able to just, you know, uh, whatever you want to call it, poofy presto, evade all those roving gangs and marauders and you know, quote unquote zombies and, and uh, uh, military patrols and checkpoints and, and getting over a bridge that where there's no bridge. How to get across the river when there's no bridge anymore. I mean, I, I just got to the point where that just didn't seem like a really viable option or a real exciting option to me. And so, uh, you know, that, that's, you know that, that's my recommendation is, you know, do it ahead of time, you know. A big part of what I have come to see is going to be necessary is to have a completely intact infrastructure and by that I mean everything you know we've got to be able to deal with every aspect of civilization and that means having an entire community around you um, we need to have the capability of maintaining civilization, a civilized lifestyle of some sort. In order to do that, we must have a large enough population base around us to do that. And, that, and I'm talking everything, you know, butcher, baker, candlestick maker, plumber, electrician, you know, um, EMT, uh, midwives, mechanics, you know, carpenters, everything, okay. You cannot do that with two people uh, on, a, on, a, on a homestead. You cannot do that with uh, your, your vaunted survivalist leaders in this country. Um, they say, they brag about the fact that we only have five people per square mile up here in Wyoming. Well, five people per square mile is gonna be run over, could be run over by anything, and one little renegade biker gang. Um, every single gang in this country, and there are at present about a thousand gangs in this country, they are all run on a military basis. 
if and when things break down, every one of those gangs will instantly go into recruiting um, hyperspeed, whatever you want to call it. You would like to join our gang or you will die. And they'll have initiation rights that will sear the conscience and destroy the moral integrity and mind of the people that have been brought, in, brought into those gangs. Every one of those gangs will be a, um, and when I'm talking a gang, that's, these gangs are on a national level, even worldwide levels. You're not talking uh, 50 people. You're talking 50,000 people. You're talking, you know, a million people in a gang. Down situation, I see things getting um, serious enough that it's going to require, and I'm going to come back to this theme, you know, again and again. Um, I, I don't want to use the word critical mass, but um, th there is historically and typically, there's a minimum amount of population needed to sustain any kind of normal life or to be for a nation to be survivable. Um, that's generally something like 25%. Uh, but what we need a, a, a enough bodies, as it were, enough warm bodies to do everything that needs to be done in a military situation, in a, in a wartime situation. Um, for every person on the front, there, the support personnel numbers in, in ballpark, you know, roughly about 20 people. You've got communications, you've got, you know, clerks, you've got uh, military, you've got KP, you know, you've got, you've got, you know, uh, uh, supply and requisition and all those, all those different things. <clears throat> About 20 people in the background to have put one man on the front. So uh, the people who, the, who are thinking of, you know, minimal, go where there's not very many people. Uh, one of these survival leaders uh, sent me a picture or, or a photograph of, uh, take a look at the United States, you know, a satellite photo at night, you know. Go where there's no lights, and my son said, "Why doesn't he go to North Korea?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, so their thinking is botched, uh, seriously um, flawed, um, in my estimation.